okay. get us started? And then Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Hello. <laughs> Uh, welcome to the Wilson Center. I am uh, Jane Harmon. I'm not so new anymore as president and CEO here, but I pinch myself every morning uh, coming to work in a place that is truly bipartisan, based on excellent scholarship, 23 different programs, and has positive energy. That doesn't sound like my last uh, place of employ. Uh, this morning we have a very serious topic to discuss conflict minerals in the Congo, a nation savaged by war for decades. Uh, as you all know, the Second Congo War, the world's deadliest since World War II, began in the 1990s when civil war and genocide spilled out of Rwanda into eastern Congo. Eight years after the peace treaty that, quote, ended hostilities, fighting in the east continues. Ungoverned militias control approximately 80% of the mines and the roads in Congo. While the war is not about minerals, it is a complex mixture of foreign rebel armies and local militias fighting the rebels and each other, they end up paying for the conflict and sustaining it. And this whole notion of something being used to pay for bad stuff is something I'm very familiar with since terrorism has been a particular uh, study of mine for years and um, the illicit drug trade pays for terrorism and this is something comparable. Some $24 trillion worth of minerals are present in Congolese soil, used in laptop computers, cell phones, food packaging, and airplane engines. Today, the Wilson Center is glad to co-sponsor this event with the Enough Project, a group which works to end genocide and crimes against humanity. Enough, led by John Bradshaw. Where's John Bradshaw? There he is. Why aren't you up here? I will be later. Oh, he yeah, will be later. Right. Step up. Well, come on up. Yeah, come on. Uh, recently released a report on conflict minerals and how to certify them for consumers. The idea that consumers can drive change. We can buy technology while preventing the illegal sales of minerals mined in Congo uh, is a great idea. And hopefully we can even send some of the profit from legitimate sales back to the DRC for critical development projects. Since 2006, the Wilson Center has worked with et ethnic communities, former militia force leaders, and formal and informal provincial leaders to rebuild trust, reconciliation, and collaborative capacities in the Democratic Republic of Congo, including negotiation, mediation, communication, and problem-solving skills. We have just begun a project to work with the command structures of the newly reformed regiments providing security in North and South Kivu, and we hope this will contribute to further amelioration of the gender-based violence and contribute to stability in the region. Now we have the pleasure, and it is a pleasure, of hearing what the U.S. government is doing to prevent the sale of Congolese conflict minerals. And the, we will hear this from Under Secretary of State Bob Hormatz, uh, a very old and dear friend of mine who's held probably more government jobs than almost anyone on the planet. Um, he manages to keep employed both in the government and out of government, uh, which is a highly valued skill. And in government, he's highly principled and effective. Um, um, and I wasn't going to say bureaucrat, but I <laughs> will not say bureaucrat. <laughs> highly, he is highly principled and effective. Um, before um, his uh, appointment as uh, Under Secretary of State, Bob Hormatz was Vice Chairman of Goldman Sachs International, uh, and before that, he served as Senior Deputy Assistant uh, Secretary and Assistant Secretary of State at the Bureau of Economic and Business Affairs. Uh, he was Ambassador and Deputy U.S. Trade Representative from 1979 to 1981. He served as Senior Staff Member for International Economic Affairs uh, at the United States Na uh, National Security Council from 1969 to 77, where he was Senior Economic Advisor to Henry Kissinger, General Brent Scowcroft, and Zbig Brzezinski. He helped to manage the Nixon administration's opening of diplomatic relations with China's government. Uh, he's been a visiting professor at Princeton, served on the Board of Visitors of the Fletcher School, uh, Dean's Council of the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. And next, he's going to come over to the Wilson Center. He hasn't heard about this yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, help with our uh, uh, major programs, as Steve McDonald does. Um, but at any rate, uh, the Africa program is one of our vaunted programs. This issue matters a lot 
and I'm very happy to be able to uh, come and thank Steve for some excellent work he did last week on Africa and come and welcome Bob um, for what I'm sure is not his first visit here uh, and to sign him up as an employee in the near future. Uh, please welcome Bob Hormetz. Well, thank you very much, Jane, um, for your lovely introduction. Jane and I have been friends for a very, very long time. And uh, not only do I want to uh, commend Jane for her leadership of Woodrow Wilson, but for her many years in Congress where she served in many capacities. But perhaps the one that stands out most in my mind is how she has dealt with issues such as intelligence, dealing with uh, issues of terrorism, uh, giving this country an enormous amount of leadership uh, on the Hill and in the community at large uh, after 9-11 and how we responded to this enormous challenge. She is just a person of enormous uh, integrity, credibility, and leadership capacity who has served her country well in so many ways, and I think the public of this country is deeply indebted to you for your public service uh, then as now as head of Woodrow Wilson. So I uh, want to thank you. In addition, we're very long lifetime friends, which makes it an even greater pleasure for me to be here with you today. I also want to uh, thank John Bradshaw and enough. Uh, enough. Um, I can't say enough about enough. Um, <laughs> uh, the moral leadership, when I, from the first week in office in this job, um, the issues that you are now uh, pursuing, leading, providing moral advice on um, have been very high on my own priority list. And I consider, and I will talk about this, I think that the issue of conflict minerals is a profound moral issue for our country, our society, and for the world. And as James pointed out, um, huge numbers of people have died there. It's the, after World War II, it's the second largest number of casualties we've had in our lifetimes. And it's not well recognized by a lot of people how brutal, how brutal it is. Uh, not just in terms of killing, which is terrible enough, but rape and murder and all the things that are just uh, traumatic for the people of this uh, region. And I've had the opportunity to go to the two Kivos years ago, and uh, I didn't see, it wasn't embroiled in the conflict when I was there, although there was a lot of tension, but what's going on there now really is enormously traumatic and therefore um, requires a bold and resolute and morally inspired uh, response by the United States and by other countries. And I'm pleased to say, and I will discuss this a bit later in the speech, that we're beginning to see uh, more and more countries that have played an active role, both within the region and outside, NGOs, the business community, and more and more participants in the federal government as well. And I'll talk about these in, in turn. Um, I also want to say that we've just had a meeting, Maria Otero and I and people from our African Bureau had a meeting very recently. We had really standing room only um, of people who understood the importance of this issue and understood the need to do something about it. It is deeply complex. Um, anyone who has studied it knows the complexities of this issue, particularly the complexities of uh, dealing with an, an, era, an area that is in virtual total chaos most of the time and sorting things out, developing credible supply lines, all of which I will talk about in greater detail. But I was uh, very pleased with the approach that people were taking in this meeting and the desire to get something done um, and the, the role of Enough and other NGOs and the creativity that people are being able to apply to this uh, in the United States, in Canada. Canada has come up with, and I see some representatives from Canadian NGOs here have also come up with some very inspired ideas, German NGOs and others. So I think we're, we're beginning to move, but we've got a long way to go, as I will describe. Um, I think the audience is uh, basically familiar with most of these issues, so I won't go into the uh, 
background of this terrible carnage, but I'd like to focus my remarks mainly on the function I see for four key actors who have uh, individually and collectively a critical role to play in this area. And one are governments in the region, um, two is industry, and there are a lot of industrial interests involved all throughout the supply chain, three, the role of civil society, which is critically important, and for the role of the U.S. government and what we in the government are trying to do about it. Let me talk about the first um, group of actors, and that is governments in the region. Uh, the regional governments play a critical role. Um, they are, in fact, the most critical players in this discussion. The illegal exploitation of minerals is first and foremost a governance challenge for the region. Uh, the DRC and its neighbors are sovereign states with responsibility for protecting their people and regulating what happens in their territories. And they must um, find ways of fulfilling those responsibilities. Without that, it'll be very difficult to do any of the other things we're talking about. We also know that rebel groups, the trade in minerals, and even state armed forces often escape the control of governments in the region, particularly in the Eastern Congo, particularly in North Kivu and South Kivu. So we don't underestimate the challenges these governments face. It's a complex problem within the Congo, but it's also a complex problem because it crosses a lot of borders. Because of that, we are pleased that the Congo and its neighbors have acknowledged their joint commitment to progress through the International Conference on the Great Lakes region, whose founding pact includes a protocol of cooperation against the illegal exploitation of natural resources. As you may know, presidents and ministers from these 11 countries that are part of this group met last December in Zambia where they adopted a regional initiative on the issue. Uh, the scheme is impressive, although some parts of it are nascent and have not yet been implemented. Uh, the group's independent inspector general and its multi-stakeholder audits will need to be effectively implemented to ensure its credibility, and that is a tough challenge given the instability and the complexity of the region. The success of this initiative will require active steps at the national level in all of these 11 countries. Zambia, to cite one example, announced in December several measures that it would take to implement domestic systems to deal with this problem. Rwanda also has taken strong preliminary steps toward setting up traceability schemes that will help provide transparency into part of the supply chain. And traceability here, credible traceability, credible auditing, is really one very important step in the process. There are many, but that is certainly one of them. These kinds of actions that I've described are particularly crucial from the point of view of the states that border the Congo's eastern provinces, since the smuggling of minerals through these porous borders undoubtedly continues and continues at a relatively rapid rate. As companies insist on knowing where their minerals come from, it will be in the interest of the Congo's neighbors to give life to their ICGLR commitments and ensure that industry can buy the legitimate output of their own mining sectors with confidence. And this point about legitimacy is particularly important given what I'll discuss in a few moments about uh, the provisions of the Dodd-Frank Act. The hardest steps, though, are yet to come, and those are particularly important with respect to what happens in the Congo. The DRC government has taken commendable measures in the last year, recognizing the urgent need for certified and traced pilot study chains in eastern DRC the DRC government has developed a coordinated strategy for security and mineral traceability in the eastern DRC. And President Kabila's acknowledgement of the role of criminal networks within the Congolese armed forces is of particular note. 
Military officers who engage in the illegal exploitation of minerals will not be deterred unless they face consequences. Prosecuting even a handful of officers for minerals trafficking, as the DRC government has begun to do for cases of rape and other atrocities, would send a powerful signal. We need to see more actions like this and more credible actions like this to send the right set of signals to the people who are engaged in these types of actions. The second actor is industry. I want to address the critical role that industry plays in this process. Companies that credibly look into the origins of their gold, their tungsten, their tin, their tantalum supplies send an important message to the rest of the world. This isn't simply and should not simply be a symbolic gesture. I've had a chance to meet with a number of companies and trade groups, all of whom, in my view, want to do the right thing. We hope that the SEC will issue its final regulation soon, but the expectation of due diligence already exists. So does the definition. It has been spelled out in detail by the OECD and then endorsed by the UN Security Council and the ICGLR. And consistent with the Dodd-Frank legislation, the State Department will soon issue a public statement on due diligence, urging companies to begin taking due diligence steps along the lines prescribed in the OECD's five-step framework for conflict-affected and high-risk areas. We recognize that these steps are not necessarily easy and that good information will be difficult to come by, especially so given the dependence of so many livelihoods on the private sector and the mining sector in the DRC. It is essential that progress be made in this area. I hope that the companies will work to find ways to adhere to the legislation and honor their obligations to their shareholders without shunning the region's minerals entirely. And this, I think, is particularly important. Uh, we do not want to exclude the trade from this region in the world markets. We want to make sure it is legitimate trade. A lot of people in this region, as perhaps you saw in the film that preceded this meeting, a lot of people depend very heavily on this. A lot of artisanal miners depend very heavily on this. So the goal is not to shut down the trade entirely, which would adversely affect a lot of people, and then you would find illegal groups trying to get around uh, whatever uh, shutdowns occur, and it would just cause the market to go further and further underground. Our goal is legitimacy. Our goal is credibility. Our goal is traceability. Our goal is accountability. These are the kind of things we're aiming for. Complex, yes, but essential to the lives of many people and to the credibility of the process. Um, that's the important thing we're looking for, and I think that distinction needs to be made repeatedly. Industry is already taking some critical steps that will facilitate this process. I want to give special praise to the forward-looking approaches taken by companies such as Motorola, Intel, and Hewlett-Packard who have done tremendous work to develop the electronics industry's approach to the challenges of due diligence. We would urge other industries that use gold, tungsten, tin, or tantalum to build on these efforts. The third group uh, and the third very important actor is civil society. They have a critical role to play and indeed have been playing a critical role for some time in raising the level of public awareness about this. And I think that has been a key starting point in motivating a lot of what is going on in terms of legislation, in terms of focus of the U.S. government, in terms of the focus of companies. Individuals and organizations from the Congo, the United States, Canada, Germany, Great Britain, and around the world have highlighted the moral and the humanitarian stakes in this issue, and enough has been an enormous moral leader, as I've pointed out before, in this area. And there are a number of other groups represented around 
um, this room who have also played a very key role. And I think that um, I commend the role of NGOs. I um, have, uh, and I think one of the diff differences between the time I was in Washington, which was over 25 years ago, and the time uh, that I now am here serving again, the, one of the big differences is the powerful role that NGOs play in addressing a lot of these issues and raising a level of consciousness in this town about them. So uh, I, I commend the NGOs for, for the moral leadership and for the determination to make these issues well known throughout the country and indeed throughout the world. Governments and companies may have been only dimly aware of the link between human rights abuses and the minerals trade um, five or six years ago, now see it more vividly in part, in large part, because of the role NGOs are playing. Going forward, civil society will be needed to provide additional security into the minerals trade, both on the ground in the Congo and in countries like ours that have economic links to this trade. Um, these groups are working on and have come up with a number of very interesting ideas on how to do this, and we value their input. And in fact, we've had numerous meetings to try to get the very best ideas from companies and from NGOs and people who have presence on the ground to learn how we can do this better. It's complicated. Good ideas are welcome. In fact, ideas from people who are on the ground there are essential. Um, I also uh, think that it's useful for uh, civil society to recognize the importance uh, that uh, we also see that there is some good work being done um, in good faith by some of the companies um, and that they can play a very positive role by shining a very bright light on those who are making a positive difference in the corporate sector. In other words, if you can show the good examples of companies that are really out there trying to do a good job, I think it will help encourage other companies also to play uh, constructive roles in this area. And I've been very impressed at how closely NGOs and a number of companies are in fact working together and I think this is a very positive development for making progress in this area since as I say all these actors are needed to, so to solve the problem. Finally, let me address the role of the U.S. government. Um, the U.S. government has an essential role to play. Right now we are focusing our assistance and our engagement on supporting as a proof of concept, the creation of pilot supply chains of conflict-free minerals. We need to show that minerals can be sourced cleanly from the region and then build on that foundation. A clean pilot supply chain, of course, requires willing buyers who exercise proper due diligence as well as credible and effective mechanisms to verify claims about the origins of the minerals. Without both of these components, the illegal trade will continue, perhaps even further into the shadows than before. The U.S. government is taking steps to support this process, and in fact, we are spending over $11 million to help establish the key links of a pilot supply chain um, that will be a good example and ultimately scalable um, for other use in um, a variety of mines and regions in the eastern part of the Congo. I hope that I've made clear in the few minutes that I've spoken that the conflict minerals trade is an area where we have a unique opportunity to make a positive difference, but we can only do so if we work together. With that in mind, I'll conclude by mentioning that the State Department and USAID are working with a variety of stakeholders to implement a public-private partnership that would bring further resources to bear toward our collective goals. The partnership will be a hub for those seeking information and ways to take action toward responsible mineral trade and sourcing, maximizing the efficiency and the impact of partners' time and resources and generating additional resources to fill key gaps for a validated conflict-free supply chain. This joint effort is a step in the right direction, but it is only a step. There remains a lot more work to be done. I'm convinced, however, and quite confident 
that with patience and persistence and the deep commitment of individuals and groups like those represented in this room, we will achieve the goal of conflict-free minerals um, supply chains throughout the region and a real objective and a real long-term objective through this effort uh, to produce a sustainable peace in the Congo. There's a lot of work here. It is very complex. We've made some progress, but we have a long way to go. And if we need any other reason to do it, it then just the, the, the mere importance of addressing this issue per se, it is the moral, the compelling moral issue behind doing this. This is one of the most significant moral issues of our time. It is not given as much publicity as some other issues, but in my view, it is one of the sig most significant moral issues of our time. And if all of us sitting here, myself, my colleagues in the U.S. government, the NGOs that are involved in this, the governments that are involved in this, and the companies are, that are involved in this, if all of us can be driven by the fact that we're doing something that will help to address this moral issue and make life better for the hundreds of thousands of people who are involved in this and, and in so doing uh, facilitate take the way toward a, uh, a peaceful solution in this region, I think we will have done something very good that we can be proud of and our children can be proud of. And those of us who serve in the federal government, we do a lot of things. Some of them are important. Some of them uh, are going to sort of vanish with the next communique. Um, which probably won't be read anyway. Um, but, but in this case, if we do something right and something <laughs> important, it will have the ef a positive effect on the lives of large numbers of people and will have an enduring impact on humanity in this troubled region. So it's worth our effort, it's worth our hard work, and it's worth the kind of collaboration that I hope that we can all work together to provide. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Secretary Hormetz. Um, we will bring up the second panel in just a few moments, uh, led by John Bradshaw. I do want to recognize Ambassador Matifu, who is going to be on that panel, but uh, recognize your presence here, Ambassador. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, Secretary Hormatz has agreed to take a few questions uh, for his, uh, from his presentation. And uh, you know the, uh, the rules here. Uh, we will uh, pass a microphone around when you have a question to ask. We are being webcast live, so please identify yourself and ask your very short and simple question. Uh, so uh, let's uh, have a round or two of questions for Secretary Hormatz before he has to go. Uh, do I hear it? see any hands? Here we go. I'm John Sewell. I'm a senior scholar here. Bob, it this is not so much a question as a thought. Uh, there's a tremendous amount of money from all sorts of donors going into aid for trade. And a good part of that is how you create uh, good custom systems uh, and a capacity within governments to monitor these kinds of flows uh, to the aims that you laid out in, uh, in your excellent speech. If you're not doing this already, uh, there's a way to capture that money. Uh, to build those capacities for governments to do what governments are supposed to do, which is uh, monitor what's happening in their own trade policy. Is the question is there are there ways to capture? Have, have you considered this to a degree? Because there are, there are parts of AIB and of the other donors, even more so, are building capacities for countries to trade. Uh, and I'm not sure the U.S. government has really fully utilized what's available to them. Oh, I see. Um, yes. In fact, uh, one of the things that we're trying to do is facilitate the ability of countries to, and, 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 and particularly in Africa. Uh, you may have seen at the recent AGOA conference, um, Ron Kirk announced that we had a very large program for Africa to help them um, on uh, trade facilitation of various kinds. There are a lot of things. I mean, this, this area is particularly unique, fortunately, in the sense that most African countries don't have the acute problems um, on trade, and, and particularly this whole, whole credible supply chain issue that, that Eastern Congo does. But what we're trying to do is find ways um, of helping them with, for instance, uh, inspection, phytosanitary inspections, things of that sort. 
um, helping them to work their way through some of the international rules uh, and understanding the international rules of trade. We tend to assume, that you, that since there are a lot of lawyers in Washington, that you hire a lawyer and they help you work out um, <laughs> trade issues with other countries. In many of these con countries, they don't have that. So sort of understanding how to navigate the rules of the, of the WTO is very important. In this area, the circumstances are, are quite unique. And um, in most of these cases, there are no or very ineffective border checks and stuff goes across the border. It's very mountainous, as you know. It's very easy to smuggle things. They're smuggled on people's backs, in some cases not, not in uh, lorries or cars. So um, no, th it makes it very difficult. But, but part, of the th part of the money that we're spending is to improve the ability of to monitor the supply chain. That most of you who are aware of this understand that, that you, you know, the stuff comes out of these mines, most of them are artisanal mines, and then you have to be able to uh, take them to the smelter or the, or the trader and then the smelter and then from the smelter on to the user. And, and monitoring that supply chain is very important and that does take people uh, who know the area and it takes money. And one of the things we're trying to do and um, are going to put more of, of our funds into is trying to ensure that there is a clean, legitimate, accountable uh, supply chain. In most countries, that's, that's not the issue. Here, it is the primary issue, and, and if we can do this. There is also um, a lot of smuggling that goes across the borders. I lived in Africa for a year on the Tanzanian and Kenyan border, and a lot of smuggling goes across because you don't have the sort of border checks. And this is another area where we're going to try to spend a fair amount of money. It is a long border, however, when you take all these countries. There are 11 countries here. Not all of them have a border with the DRC, but they all are one way or another part of this so -called of this supply chain. So you really have to do a lot of work all along the supply chain to monitor it. The most complicated work is from the mine to the um, traders who sort of aggregate it to the smelters. If you can get clean supply chain lines, um, then you, you've solved a good portion of the problem. Our Canadian friends have come up with some interesting ideas on this and we're working with them. They came to our last meeting, in fact, so this really has to be an international project. And the best ideas from all over the world are the ones we're looking for. Okay, I see a question, yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Adam Taylor with World Vision. Um, thanks for your presentation. Um, you mentioned that governance is kind of the key stumbling block in, in many respects. And I, want, I was wondering if you could comment a little bit more about how the U.S. government is using the lever of pretty significant aid flows to n a number of the regional governments in that, in that area in order to incentivize better governments. Well, it's a very good question. Govern governance clearly is the problem. I mean, we've got, I mean, we've got UN forces in the region, as you know, trying to create a measure of stability. We don't, they're not American forces in there, but they're under the aegis of the UN. Um, not ours, though, but other, from other countries. Uh, second, we're providing support for the DRC to help improve <coughs> its, its general governance capabilities. Um, I think that the I think that the government of the government of the DRC does want to address this issue. Um, first of all, no country likes to have chaos and murder and rape in two key provinces, uh, whatever the country. Second, um, if the trade were legalized and they um, would benefit, as other countries do, by being able to collect taxes on the output. Um, as Jane said, there's a lot of uh, minerals in, in the Congo through, you know, goes down from the two Kivu, Kivus, um, goes down to Kakanga. They have a lot of mineral wealth. They want to be able to have legal exports so that they can, and legal revenues so that they can um, get the taxes and spend them on development or whatever else they want to spend them on. So they, have a, they actually have a, a strong interest in improving governance themselves. The difficulty is that it is a very remote area. In many cases, they're not roads, they're not proper roads to even get the police in to monitor what's going on, let alone whether the police are corrupt or not, uh, or the military is corrupt or not, so that the, even the physical infrastructure 
is not there. If you did have a, um, a credible monitoring system, it would be very hard to get there. So what we're trying to do is work with the DRC and, and to, to provide ways of helping them to improve the, the, the presence of, of government in the region and to enable the, the govern, government process in the region to exercise some control over what's going on now. For the moment, it's very hard, it's very hard to do. It's just, A, it's remote, and B, there are a lot of forces there, as I mentioned in my speech, over which the government simply doesn't have control. And we are doing this, and a lot of other countries are too. I mean, uh, Germany is uh, a, a very substantial program to help improve governance in the region. And so it's not just the United States. A lot of countries are actively involved in doing this, but it is, is very complicated. And um, I would say some progress has been made, but if we're going to have clean, monitorable, um, auditable uh, supply chains so that proper due diligence can be done, uh, governance has to improve a lot because if you don't do that, it's awfully hard for companies to certify that the supply chain is a clean supply chain from, from mine to, to the aggregators to the, uh, to the smelters and then on, onward. So a lot of work has to be done in that area. And if you don't have good governance in the region, it's awfully hard, or governance, much less good governance, some governance, uh, it's very hard to do very hard to do it credibly. That's why we want to have a prototype supply chain that people at all levels can say is, is, is identifying clean minerals and enabling them to get to the smelters. And then the smelters can certify that the supply chain is a clean supply chain. And then the users can then uh, certify it too. But if you don't have that upstream auditing and a, a, and a clean, um, credible supply chain from the mines downward or onward, it's a lot harder to do all the other stuff. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. I saw a hand right in the middle here. Uh, Ina Koshikova from the state. Um, I had a question about China. China is the new rising player in the region. Um, what, you haven't touched on it as being one of the four players. But what has been China's role and impact <coughs> in this region regarding minerals in the Congo? Well, the, we, the China is really not. I mean, I don't. I don't. It's it's somewhat hard to know what role China is playing in the region. Most of the um, the uh, countries that are in actively engaged in this now are the United States. Uh, Western Western Europe and some other East Asian countries where the smelters exist, but um, which are I think Malaysia, Thailand. Is it Thailand, Malaysia? Which are they the two? They're the two main ones. Yeah, um, they're they're the uh, they're the ones who've been actively engaged. We have really not had an active dialogue with the with the Chinese on this issue. This is not to say, and and I just don't know what portion of this might go out. To, uh, to China because China is making more and more of the f cell phones and things that utilize this. We haven't had as active a discussion with the Chinese as others. We probably will have to do that, but for the moment, we've, it's not been a, a, big, um, a big priority, but, but, uh, or it's not been a big focal point of this, but it will, down the road, I think we will, um, if, they, if they continue to play a role and they use these minerals, uh, to a large degree, um, then we will we will have to do this. But and, and and if as their and their companies, you know, just like our companies have to do these certifications, um, we're g we will uh, clearly want the Chinese companies to do these certifications too. Uh, what what the reach of our law will be at this point, I don't know. Okay, well, thank you very much, Secretary Hormats. Join me in thanking the secretary. Now, I just want to echo the Secretary's uh, 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 compliments about, uh, about the Enough Project. Uh, I've been knowing them since John Pendergrass and Gail Smith, old friends of mine, uh, uh, put it together. I'm going to call up uh, uh, John Bradshaw now with the rest of the panel. Uh, John is the uh, new uh, uh, executive director since January, I guess, of, uh, of, enu of Enough. Uh, before he was there, he was uh, with the Physicians for Human Rights Project. 
and he's previously served as a coordinator on the Human Rights Leadership uh, Coalition, a uh, group made up of 13 major uh, U.S. Uh, business rights, or, uh, human rights organizations, including the Physicians for Human Rights. Um, so, uh, John, with no further ado, bring your panel up. <coughs> Okay. <clears throat> it was um, quite gratifying and encouraging to hear Under Secretary Hormat's um, talk about this issue as one of the most significant moral issues of our time. That's something uh, we had enough agree with, uh, but it's good to hear it from a very senior U.S. official and his personal commitment to which he has evidenced by being here and by meeting with NGOs a number of times in uh, over the past six months or so. Uh, and we know Secretary Clinton also has spoken uh, on several occasions about how important uh, issues in the Congo are to her personally. Um, Secret uh, Under Secretary Hormatz also talked about how, how NGOs um, are, have the role of kind of pushing the State Department forward, and I can guarantee him that that will continue to happen with the Enough Project. Um, a lot of the things the State Department are, are, is doing are, are, are very good, but we want more. And we would like to see a full-blown certification process uh, be put in place um, in the coming years, uh, something that the, the State Department may not be quite yet ready to uh, endorse, but we will keep pushing on that. Uh, we have a, um, a great panel here, which I think shows how many different uh, types of, of organizations and uh, from so many different sectors are involved with this issue. We have uh, Ambassador uh, Mitifu from the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, and we also have representatives uh, from the British government, Clive Wright, Tim Moen from industry, and Sasha uh, Lesnev from the Enough Project. I think uh, seeing that you have industry, government, NGOs, representatives of the Congo, um, how many people are working together to try to uh, affect change in the Congo? The one group that I think is missing here um, is uh, Congolese civil society. There are many groups on the ground in the Congo who are pushing very hard for this. I was just out there a couple of months ago and the civil society representatives I met with who um, are from some of the mining areas are, are passionately committed to addressing these issues and very much appreciate what uh, NGOs are doing. Um, so this is not something that's being imposed by Western governments or governments in the region is something that the, the, the grassroots civil society uh, organizations in the Congo are very much in favor of. Um, so we will go through uh, the panel members will each speak for about five minutes and then we'll have time for uh, Q&A after that. Uh, first we have uh, Ambassador uh, Mitufu from, from the DRC. Um, very interesting of course that uh, the ambassador was born in Bukavu in South Kivu, which is there in the eastern Congo, in right in the, in the heart of the area that um, we are we are talking about today, um, she has been the ambassador to the United States since 1999, quite a long uh, period to serve here. So, and she's very familiar with these issues. Uh, we have sheets with the bio information of all the panelists outside, so I won't go through all the details. You can find that there. But uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Ambassador Mitifu. Thank you very much, and I would like to thank the Wilson Center again for hosting uh, this panel. But my thanks also goes to the representative of the U.S. government, um, Mr. Homat, whom I have shared uh, a panel, several panels before, uh, I, I, at least two of them organized by the Enough Project. And um, 
I think his speech today uh, was quite crucial, crucial in the sense that uh, he took some of the things that I, w I was going to talk about uh, uh, away, uh, which is good, so I will not take too much uh, time uh, uh, in terms of uh, talking about uh, what is being made, uh, not only by the Congolese government, but also by its international partners. Um, I will not get back into the history of this. I believe the video uh, touched a lot on the history and also uh, Mr. Homat also uh, talked a little bit about the background of uh, that led to the efforts that we are witnessing today. Um, I will talk more about what the government is doing, and then uh, probably I'll give more details during the Q&A section. Indeed, the government of the Democratic Republic of the Congo um, has been uh, the subject of the conflict minerals, and um, the international community uh, has been quite concerned with this issue, which is a positive step uh, towards resolving the issue of the conflict mineral. The government of Congo is determined and very much committed to see a credible chain of supply of the minerals out of the Congo. And in doing so, the government has taken some steps uh, in order to implement and to put in place a credible uh, traceability system and certification system in the Democratic Republic of the Congo so that we can export clean minerals. And some of the steps um <coughs> that the government has taken, uh, they are on the security uh, uh, plan, but also on the commercial uh, plan. Uh, on security, <coughs> we have done the best that we could and we continue to do so in dealing with armed groups. We have even sometimes joined efforts uh, with our neighbors, especially from Rwanda and in the northeastern part of the country with Uganda in order to destabilize or contain the activities of many of the armed <coughs> groups. Today, uh, though the situation is not perfect yet, uh, we have seen some progress. We have destabilized most of these groups, and despite sporadic uh, attacks uh, on the population by these groups, uh, we have uh, been able to destabilize them, and they are much less organized today than they were uh, a few years ago. <coughs> and also, we, ha we are also making headways in demilitarizing uh, the mining areas, the mining sites in the eastern part of the country. And when we talk about the eastern part of the country, we're not really talking about uh, the Katanga province uh, per se. It's mainly the Kivus, uh, North Kivu, South Kivu, and also the Maniema province. And in the northeastern part of the country where we're dealing with LRA, it's a whole different issue that we're dealing with. Um, <coughs> also, uh, we have been uh, able to weaken quite substantially uh, the parallel administration because we had parallel administration, especially in, uh, in North Kivu where we had uh, administration led by rebels but also uh, by the government. So we, the government is expanding slowly but surely its authority in that area. Um, we have also made effort to try to integrate uh, some of the armed groups and we have been working closely with MONUSCO to repatriate some of the FDLR elements and some of them who are not who don't want to be repatriated, we have been working with some of them to try to find an alternative solution to the repatriation to Rwanda with the help of MONUSCO, of course. Uh, we, the government is truly determined 
to make these, these area that are areas of conflict to make them uh, rather peaceful. Uh, on on, uh, <coughs> uh, on say the, the reform in the mining sectors, uh, the Ministry of Mining has just published a manual of the traceability of uh, mineral products in the Congo. And this has been uh, validated by uh, a ministerial, uh, what we call arete ministerial. Um, and um, we've been working very closely with MONUSCO. We are also uh, working on introducing uh, centers that we call Centre de Negos, which are centers where um, all the, the partners, even the small miners, can come and bring their product in order to put them in the right uh, commercial, uh, on in the right uh, uh, supply chain. And those uh, are being put in place also in collaboration with MONUSCO. We are working very closely with MONUSCO, but also with uh, with OIM, the Organization for uh, of Migration. Um, we have just also, we are also uh, elaborating a validation system uh, of, the, uh, of uh, the certification system of minerals such as gold and tin. And the, with this, we have had the help and collaboration of, uh, of, of Germany in in trying to establish uh, the validation, uh, the certification of gold and tin. Uh, also, in order to respond to the concerns of the, the end users, um, and in order also to respond to the, the uh, Doug Frank bill, uh, we are also working with MONUSCO, but also with the local private sector in, co uh, in compliance with OECD in order to make truly the minerals in, the, in that area clean minerals. Um, we have also put in place a coordination, uh, a national coordination uh, to fight uh, fraud uh, fraudulent activities of the minerals. And as we speak, I'm sorry, <coughs> as we speak, we have a delegation, a high level delegation of the Ministry of Mining uh, who came to participate in another conference uh, with the private sector here in the United States to work with them and to explain to them very clearly what the government has been doing, what step the government has been making in order to coordinate the effort with all our international partners and NGOs. Um, and I think I will, I will stop there. I think my time is out and I'll be more than happy to answer some of the questions. Uh, thank you again for giving me the opportunity. Thank you very much, Madam Ambassador. Um, you know, as, as we heard from <coughs> Secretary Hormats, uh, this is indeed a moral issue, but it has a very pragmatic dimension, and you see all of the things that the DRC government is trying to do and others uh, that take this pra pragmatic step-by-step -step ap approach to trying to deal with this issue. Um, next, we have Clive Wright, who is a British diplomat currently based in Ottawa, Canada, um, and has previously served in Washington. Uh, he is an expert on the Kimberley process, having been involved with it for many years. And you may wonder why we are talking about a, a process for certification of diamonds, uh, which is not the issue in the Congo. But we think that the Kimberley process can be a good model for the kind of certification process we would like to see in the Congo. And also, it, it had some problems uh, that Clive will talk about that we can learn from uh, and uh, improve the process going forward. Um, so, Clive, go ahead. Thank you very much, John, and good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you to the Woodrow Wilson Center for the opportunity and to Enough uh, the opportunity to talk about uh, the Kimberley process 
uh, Kimberley Process Certification Scheme. I, I know in, in, in US English, scheme sounds rather devious. Um, <laughs> I think we're supposed to use Kimberley Process Certification System. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe I'll stick to that. Um, as John say, uh, I used to be in Washington. It's, it's great to be back here um, as a British government agent sneaking over the border from Canada. I'm only allowed to stay a few hours, and <laughs> I've got to go back. <laughs> but uh, it's a fantastic city. Um, in Canada, the government, I hope they don't mind me saying this, uh, uh, are talking about <coughs> how they're going to commemorate um, next year the uh, 200th anniversary of a war with the US, in which my country, as you remember, took part. And we snuck up the river here, and we set fire to Washington. But without doing that, you wouldn't have a White House. So I take full credit for <laughs> creating the White House. <laughs> um, <coughs> anyway, let's talk about another conflict. Uh, I was part of the Kimberley Process um, negotiation in 2000, uh, around about October. I um, joined uh, my department in London and um, headed up the UK delegation to the Kimberley Process for about four and a half years. Uh, we were part of the European Union um, negotiating team. And in November 2003, uh, I think it was, we finally reached agreement <coughs> amongst 75 or so <coughs> countries, which in itself was quite an achievement, to set up the, the uh, KPCS, let me call it that. Um, for those of you not familiar, and I suspect a lot of you are, uh, very briefly, it's a quite simple, actually, certification process, which was designed purely to control the trade in rough diamonds, to make that a regulated, licit trade to prevent rough diamonds from funding the sort of wars we saw in Sierra Leone, in Angola, and um, more brutally, perhaps, in the DRC. So it had a very simple objective. Um, it was always designed to be what we called a light but effective scheme system. So you had a, an agreement that allowed <laughs> that trade in rough diamonds to flow around the world, providing each consignment of rough diamonds was accompanied by a certificate from the government <coughs> of the exporting country and providing there was legislation in place that required that, that certificate and legislation in place in the importing country only allowing rough diamonds into that country if they are uh, accompanied by the proper certificate. Uh, you had uh, alongside that detailed information exchanges between the participating countries as to their production, their importing, their export statistics, uh, you had a monitoring system. I'll come back to that in a minute. It was a sort of peer review more than formal monitoring. So it was, it was as, as simple as that. I mean, it took about three years to negotiate it, but I think between governments, that's almost a record. Mm -hmm. um, we deliberately wanted industry and civil society, we the governments, from the very start to be part of that process. They were highly instrumental in getting it going. If you talk to uh, NGOs like Global Witness, Partnership Africa Canada, Amnesty International, they were very much at the forefront of highlighting the problem. So too was the UN, uh, a retired excellent Canadian diplomat, Bob Fowler, um, worked with the UN and produced a report uh, about the link between conflict in those particular countries in Africa and rough diamonds. So we were very inclusive. We sat around the table together. It didn't matter which, what nameplate you had in front of you, whether you were government, civil society, or um, or industry, you had the equal voice. Uh, everything was done by consensus, which could be rather painful at times, but it did lead to a situation where we got an agreement that we felt everyone had bought into. So we had strength of purpose. There was a real conviction that everyone was kind of working towards the same goal. We, we arrived at the table with very different agendas. I mean, for industry, they hated the idea, absolutely hated the idea of government regulating them. And actually, the British government hated the idea as well, because our philosophy at the time, and still is, I hope, is that we deregulate industry. We get rid of the red tape. And here we were for the first time ever saying, well, actually, we're going to introduce a regulation on an entire industry. So that it took us a while to get wrap our head around that. Um, but the, the objective was obvious and, and was worthy. Um, we all worked very closely together. We, we negotiated together for about three years. It was pretty much the same people the whole time from the different groups. So we got to trust each other, uh, like each other. Uh, I, as a diplomat, found it really exhilarating. I could sort of pick up the phone and ring Moscow and say, how do we sort this out? And, and we'd sort something out, which I'm not normally allowed to do. It's normally <coughs> lots of diplomatic notes and what I call lace hanky-waving at each other to try and get things done. But picking up the phone, ringing Beijing, or, uh, was, was terrific. So it did work. Um, and for the last seven or eight years, we've been implementing it fairly successfully to a point. Um, 
And I want to come now and talk very quickly about some of the failings. Actually, today's a very interesting day. There's a, a meeting of the Kimberley process going on in Kinshasa, um, which might see the Kimberley process implode. I hope it doesn't, but I need to talk a little bit about why it went wrong, or why it's not working the way that we would like it to. Um, first of all, it's not a legally binding agreement. That may seem a rather bureaucratic thing to say, but actually it's quite important. Y you don't have levers that you can use so successfully in a politically binding agreement, which is what the KPS, KPCS is, as opposed to a, a legally binding treaty. Um, we do not have independent monitoring. The monitoring system that was put in place took a long time to negotiate. In fact, when we signed the agreement, we didn't have a monitoring agreement. It came later. But we eventually established this system of peer review. So people like me would lead teams into different countries, and we would try and do an honest assessment of how well that country was doing in securing its supply chain, in monitoring the flow of diamonds out, any flow of diamonds coming in, and cooperating with the other governments in the, in the system. And everything was done by consensus. And that's a problem. Because it only takes one country to say, or one player to put up their hand and say, actually, I don't agree. So in the early stages where we had that unity of purpose, and we were very upset, most of us, by the way, in which, for example, the Republic of Congo was blatantly cheating, or Cote d'Ivoire, or Venezuela, or Lebanon, and various other countries, like Liberia, we threw them out. How do you throw them out by consensus? And it's almost like uh, Lebanon says, yep, I want to be thrown out, please. But they did. They did. Cote d'Ivoire stepped aside and said, no, I'm, I'm behaving very badly. I simply must step to one side, and I'll get back to you later. Fantastic. They believed in the process. They wanted that process to work. They recognized that their systems, for whatever reason, Cote d'Ivoire, it was a rumbling civil war. Um, in Venezuela, they just didn't have, have the... Uh, the procedures in place in Lebanon, their parliament was using the Kimberley process as some sort of political football to kick around. So they got kicked out or, or just stepped to one side voluntarily. And that helped to make the process a very visible, very robust sort of process that people accepted. In the Republic of Congo, when they got thrown out, one of the first phone calls they got was from the IMF saying, how come you're not fulfilling your obligations under the Kimberley process? And what does that mean for us in the IMF if you can't be trusted to implement those things? At which point Brazzaville said, oh, I think we'll fulfill the Kimberley process now. And they came back in. So it can be a very effective tool in that way. But I'm afraid the political rats have got at it. Um, I shouldn't name who they are. Perhaps they know who they are. But some countries um, decided that the allure of being able to earn lots of money from diamonds, uh, not for the benefit of their people, but for the benefit of individuals within their government, uh, were so great that they were prepared to break the consensus, to break the political agreement, uh, and go their own way. And that's the subject of the discussion that's going on now within the Kimberley process. So I think the failing was we couldn't, we couldn't have any other system other than a politically binding agreement that required consensus and required the political will and the vision and the determination of all the players to keep in there. I think the NGOs did a great job. They're great policemen at trying to make sure governments sort of are honest. I think industry really wanted this to happen because it had a real impact on their credibility and their standing, and they welcomed it. I think most governments uh, were really keen to see it happen too, but not all of them. And that's, that's been a failing. And it's been difficult for the Kimberley process to uh, address uh, bad behavior by governments over the last couple of years because that political will seems to be evaporating. We don't have independent monitoring. We don't have the ability to independently um, verify statistics. A lot of governments wouldn't sign up to it. You know, if you're a government, again, without naming names, that has been used to state controls and transparency and democracy is a bit of a stretch, then having somebody independently look at your diamond production statistics, which actually in your legislation originally was illegal to do, you weren't even allowed to talk about it, is very difficult for them. So it's been a great sort of lesson, a great a great achievement in many ways. I hope it doesn't implode, um, but I think it's in danger of doing so. So there are lots of good lessons that others should learn from the last seven or eight years with, with the KPCS. I'll stop there, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Clive. And uh, one of the things we are trying to ensure in this process going forward is that it is depoliticized and has independent monitoring. It's at an absolute baseline for making this work, and that's one of the lessons we've learned from, from you and others uh, who are familiar with the Kimberly process. Next, we have Tim Moen, Director of Corporate Responsibility for Advanced Micro Devices. 
Um, Tim has also worked for Apple and Intel over the years, and prior to that was a Senate committee staffer and also worked at the EPA, so has lots of Washington experience as well as corporate responsibility experience. Go ahead, Tim. Thanks, John, and uh, good morning. Oh, let's try that again. Uh, <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Uh, that's much better. Um, you know, I was telling somebody in the back before this uh, panel that I feel privileged to work on this issue. Uh, and they kind of went, privilege? You know, why? Um, well, there's two reasons. One, as Hormatz, or Sen uh, Bob Hormat said, uh, this is a compelling issue, perhaps the most compelling moral issue of our time. But two, it's a unique issue. As I reflect back on uh, 25 years of working in social and environmental issues, you see kind of an evolution. You know, when I started, we were dealing with pollution issues, local issues around factories, and kind of fighting that trench warfare. As I moved on in my career and started working for Apple, we were looking at the supply chain and, and quickly went global and looking at factories in China that were assembling products. Now, with this conflict minerals issue, we have really connected the supply chain from end to end. And I think it's just a representation of how truly global we are, how when something's going on at one end of the supply chain, you really just can't ignore it. You have to take it into account. I'm somewhat daunted being on this panel, being the only representative industry. I want to make clear that I'll be talking, uh, representing my own company, AMD, but I'm also going to be representing the actions of many, many others uh, from the Electronic Industry Citizenship Coalition, EICC, and JESSE, the Global E-Sustainability Initiative. Uh, I know it's a mouthful, but I'll be uh, referring to their activities a lot uh, throughout the talk. So, so why are we involved in this? Why is industry involved in this um, in the beginning? Um, you know, we could have said we don't use a lot of this material. Uh, we could have said, you know, this is pretty far down the supply chain. We can't influence it. In fact, you know, when you look at the four minerals in question here, uh, the electronics industry in, as a total is only the majority user of one of those materials, tantalum. Uh, and when I say electronics industry, I'm talking everything from like toaster ovens to iPods. So it's, it's a broad industry. And only one of them we have a majority interest in. But we didn't say any of that. We, we took it upon ourselves to really take leadership on this issue and take <coughs> action. And I want to tell you about some of the things that, that we have done. Bob Hormatz in his talk talked a little bit about the supply chain. Let me try and break it down for you a little bit more. There's really three stages to the supply chain. When you look at it very simplistically, it looks like an hourglass. The, the upstream stage is kind of where all the artisanal miners that are kind of digging things out of the ground uh, bring them together to traders and exporters and all the way down to the smelters. So that's the upstream phase or the, the wide funnel in the hourglass. The, the, the choke point, the middle of that hourglass, are the smelters. That's stage two. That's the choke point. And then stage three is the bottom part of the hourglass where it goes from a refined mi mineral or refined metal from a smelter all the way through to a final product, to that, that iPod, that toaster oven, that jet engine uh, that you might uh, have encountered in your life. So that's the supply chain. It's incredibly complex. What have we done as an industry, as EICC, Jesse? So we've taken action on the two parts, the two of the three parts of the supply chain that we can influence. Working together, we uh, developed what's called a conflict-free smelter program. Uh, none of us ever thought we'd be working with that part of the supply chain. We had to do a lot of learning and educating ourselves on how smelters really work, but we did it. We quickly found out uh, what that industry is about. We created an audit program to make sure that any of the materials that enter a particular smelter are, in fact, from clean sources. Once we know that, we can sort certify those smelters, and then the downstream part comes in. We've created a due diligence process so that everyone in the supply chain can track their materials back to a smelter that's been certified in this conflict-free smelter program. And I want to just pause there for a minute because a lot of people kind of gloss over that point, but it's an incredibly complex supply chain. I was talking about globalization a little bit earlier. When we passed the Dodd-Frank legislation, and now uh, it's turning into a regulation from the SEC, that's not just a regulation for U.S.-based companies. It is, in fact, a global regulation. Our materials come from everywhere. When you start tracking materials from smelters to final product, there's very few countries that you're not impacting. 
So whether or not that law applies to that particular entity, they may be in Taiwan, they may be in China, uh, their customers are going to require them to comply. They're going to require them to track their materials back to a clean smelter. So you might have uh, noticed when I was going through that, I left out one key area of the supply chain, and that's that upstream part, that funnel, going from the artisanal miners to the smelter. As you might imagine, that's probably the most difficult part of the supply chain for industries like ours to get involved in. I mean, these are socioeconomic, geopolitical issues that have been going on for decades. Yes, it's extremely compelling, but how do companies get involved in dealing with security issues, in dealing with infrastructure issues, in dealing with political issues in those countries? This is where we need U.S. government leadership. We need the government to step up, working with the governments of the Congo and the other, region, other countries in the region, to try and develop a reliable, certified, sustainable system to give us clean materials from that region. It hasn't happened yet, and as a result of that, what we're seeing now is, frankly, an embargo. Uh, Bloomberg reported uh, just a couple of weeks ago in May that 90 percent of the trade in minerals from the Congo has dried up, 90 percent of the trade. That's an amazing number. Um, you know, the only way to get minerals to be com or to get smelters to be conflict free right now in the process is to avoid the Congo. So essentially what the law and the regulations have built in is this de facto embargo. And I think one of the, uh, the uh, activists from the DRC said it best when he wrote a letter to the Securities and Exchange Commission. He goes, are our choices really bullets or starvation? Is that what we're facing here? Uh, so we have to figure this out. We have to come up with better solutions. So let me give you a couple of ideas for solutions. First, as I mentioned before, we need leadership from the U.S. government. Uh, our friends with Enough, which uh, I never thought I'd be sitting here on podium after podium. I see you more than I see my family uh, with Enough, um, have, have just issued a report yeah, uh, that, that call for U.S. government leadership, and they use the term conductor. Uh, and I, I, I really want to just sort of align behind that because I think that's exactly what we need. The analogy was made to Bill Clinton in the mid-'90s. Uh, working with footwear and apparel manufacturers to come up with the Fair Labor Association. And Tony Blair, uh, same thing on the Ethical Trading Initiative. We need someone with gravitas to step up and really take leadership. The second is the public-private partnership that was mentioned a couple of times earlier. Uh, we in industry, along with other partners, NGOs, governments, multinational organizations, have begun to work together on this public-private partnership to develop a pilot scale validated supply chain. Bob Hormetz talked about that. It's, it's great, it's wonderful, but it's a small start. We need scale and we need it now. Uh, incentives. Um, right now, the way the law is set up, the incentives are all backwards. Uh, unfortunately, uh, even if we had a reliable certification system in the region, the law requires that any company sourcing from the region has to file a public report that is audited by a third party. So anytime you source from that area of the world, you have to file a public third-party audited report. That doesn't apply to any other region. So even if we had this whole thing working, we have this burden that sets up the incentives in the wrong place. One thing we could do in the solutions area is to look at a fair trade system, much like the Forest, Stu Forest Stewardship Council or the Rainforest Alliance or Fair Trade Coffee. There are ways to do this that, that companies could actually say, hey, look, I'm doing the right thing and I'm going to tell my consumers about it. The fourth area is uh, transitional aid. Uh, as we move from the current situation to where we want to be in this future of having clean sourcing from the region, there will be economic displacement. We're hearing about it now. What do we do about that? We need aid organizations to step up and really help these artisanal miners who are innocent and who are being harmed economically by this transition. And the fifth is security. Um, I just read a book called uh, The Heart and the Fist by Eric Greitens. Uh, Eric uh, was a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, he graduated from the best university in America, Duke University. Uh, yes, I did go to Duke. Um, and uh, he, was a, uh, he is a humanitarian. He volunteered everywhere from Rwanda in the genocide to Bosnia during their civil war. 
And during this time, as he was delivering humanitarian aid, he realized, you know, it's not enough to come in after the fact and just try and help people when they've already been abused. You have to prevent it in the first place. And he took this upon himself and went and became a Navy SEAL uh, because he says it has to be a balance between the two. We need security. If we're going to develop clean sourcing mechanisms in the Congo, there's all kinds of reasons that uh, invested interests would want to take those apart. And those invested interests have weapons. Uh, so we need security. Um, lastly, I just want to close by saying we have to make this work. Uh, there's too much at stake. Um, that we not only have we invested in the industry so much in trying to make this happen, but there's the moral imperative that Bob Hormat spoke about. There's real lives, there's real issues, there's humanitarian needs at stake. We have to make this work. Dodd-Frank got the ball rolling, but without some of these other issues, it won't work. We need more work to make this happen. Um, the Obama administration, 16 senators called on the Obama administration a few weeks ago to appoint a special envoy uh, to the region so that we could coordinate all of these activities and really try to break the mineral curse once and for all in the Congo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, our last uh, panelist uh, who will take five minutes and then we'll have questions. Since he works for me, I can make him stick to that. <laughs> all right. Uh, Sasha Lesnev is a, a consultant to us at the Enough Project. Um, he has a lot of experience in the, the region. He's been out to Congo a number of times, uh, previously worked at Global Witness on some of these same issues and also um, at the International Crisis Group and the U.S. Institute of Peace um, and has uh, contributed to uh, the paper that you'll see outside uh, that the Enough Project just put out a couple of months ago that I encourage you all to read at least the uh, executive summary of. Sasha. Thank you. <coughs> Is this on? Can yeah. people hear me? Okay, great. Great. Thank you very much, John. And uh, after so many distinguished uh, panelists from Undersecretary Hormats to the Ambassador to uh, Clive and Tim, uh, there's nothing left for me to do besides show pictures. <laughs> uh, so that's what I'll try to do. <laughs> and uh, as an advocate, it would, uh, it uh, I would uh, be abdicating my responsibility if I didn't say a few words with the pictures. Let's see, how do we? Uh, okay, there we go. Great. Okay. Um, uh, thank you again to the Woodrow Wilson Center for, for hosting the event and to Undersecretary Hormats and, and also to AMD, uh, who's done a, a fantastic job in, in, in starting to trace their supply chains. Um, I got back from uh, Eastern Congo uh, fairly recently, and uh, I would like to highlight a couple of things that I saw, give a little bit of a background on, on what this trade actually looks like, and, and point some of the ways uh, forward. Uh, what I saw when I was out in the region is that uh, this issue and this particular region, after being neglected for so many years, uh, is getting more and more attention than ever. Uh, but if we actually give up the fight now, uh, after some of the achievements have been uh, in the spotlight that's actually happening on the, on the region now, we may actually end up leaving it worse than when we started. Uh, attacks right now from armed groups are on the rise. Uh, smuggling, particularly of gold, is also on the rise. Uh, legislation that passed last year that was signed almost a year ago uh, is helping act as a stick, uh, but there's really no carrot, as Tim mentioned, for, as an incentive for a clean trade. And so there's no agreed upon process yet uh, to certify, monitor uh, the trade from the region uh, and penalize uh, those actors that may be breaking it. And so we, we think that the administration can really help to galvanize uh, this process going forward uh, with uh, three main steps to buttress what they're already doing uh, in the public-private partnership and enhance uh, the pilot supp supply chains that uh, Undersecretary Hormats uh, uh, had outlined uh, at a low cost. And it can do that with companies' help. Uh, essentially, just to give a very quick background uh, visually, um, as we try to cram more and more megapixels and apps into our devices, whether they're cell phones or laptops or even cars, 
Um, these require specialized minerals. And so if you just look as one example uh, inside a, a smartphone, um, uh, the, the minerals from uh, Eastern Congo's war zone that, that have these specialized uh, functions are actually inside. So many of them are on the, the circuit board. Um, so we call them three T's and gold. So tin, tantalum, tungsten, and gold. So tin is actually a solder that helps glue the different components uh, inside your cell phone or your laptop together. Uh, tantalum, or coltan as it's known in, in Congo, uh, this is kind of a mini battery, so every time you t send a text message or um, try to surf the web, that's tantalum at work, and the, the, the bigger your screen and so forth, the more of these capacitors you actually have. Uh, tungsten helps your phone vibrate. It's also in the screen um, and, and a number of other functions. Uh, and gold is actually a connector uh, inside your phones and is obviously used in jewelry as well. Now, armed groups have been controlling uh, these mines and trading routes uh, throughout Eastern Congo. These are all photos that I took uh, out there. As you can see, they're present uh, right at the mines. Uh, this is a picture I took right outside of a mine during a raid. And they also control a number of the trading routes from the mines to the points of export. So this was a, a CNDP checkpoint. This is the parallel administration uh, that we had spoken about. And, and here you have uh, military units that are basically shaking down whatever vehicles pass for, for bribes. Um, as one uh, colonel, as, excuse me, one captain of, uh, of the army that I spoke to when I was out there, he told me, I didn't join the army for minerals, but now it's not bad because I can access them. We trade guns for minerals with the FDLR. He told me that I might, I, I know that I might end up getting shot with my own weapon, but that's Eastern Congo. The human impact has been devastating as the armed groups continue to buy uh, weapons with the profits. The displacement levels are very high. Uh, over five million people have been killed and hundreds of thousands of women uh, have been raped in, in eastern Congo and there are child miners, uh, many of whom are forced to mine either at gunpoint or economically forced. Uh, this was a, a miner who was 11 years old that I met with. Uh, there are, the good news is that there is some progress. Uh, as Ambassador mentioned, the Congolese government is taking a number of steps with their traceability manual. Uh, the Electronics Industry Citizenship Coalition, as Tim mentioned, is, is starting their audit program for tantalum, uh, tin, tungsten, and gold. Uh, they've already actually passed a couple of companies already. Uh, armed groups are starting to pull out of mines, which is uh, a helpful uh, process, but uh, not yet completed. Uh, we have agreed upon due diligence standards from the OECD and the UN Security Council. Uh, you have the outlines of regional certification and you have bagging and tagging by the tin industry at some pilot mine sites that uh, uh, do not yet have a monitoring process. Unfortunately, the risks of sticking with the, uh, with the status quo are, are still uh, high. And so if we continue to just uh, uh, go forward with uh, how things are currently, we will just cut off the region, cut off the thousands of miners that were working in these mines. Uh, and without a monitoring process, it will be very difficult to tell which minerals are clean and which ones are actually dirty. Uh, as an army colonel, uh, a different one uh, from the one I mentioned previously, told me, he said, if we stick with what we have now, quote, all the people involved in identifying the minerals will take bribes. They will give letters to outsiders, and no one will lodge complaints. Those who have papers will continue smuggling, and the government will be the loser. I don't think that any of us wants to really end up with that situation. And so if we want the legislation to have uh, a lasting impact and not simply drive the trade underground or paper over uh, minerals that are coming out of the region, uh, we're going to need a certification process where companies can do business in the region but at the same time have uh, ethical guarantees that are actually verifiable and drive business to clean mines and away from mines that are not certified. We want this process to learn the lessons uh, of the Kimberley process, as Clive mentioned, to have verification and monitoring and to be multi-stakeholder and inclusive. And so to that end, uh, we, uh, as companies are looking for these assurances, we uh, need to involve them in a process of certification, and we think that the, um, uh, similar to what happened with uh, President Clinton in 1996 and then 98, 
uh, where he called different sweatshop labor campaigners, universities, and companies together uh, to help kickstart certification that turned into the Fair Labor Association. Uh, we think that the administration can build on uh, its public-private partnership and pilot supply chains to actually move certification, the regional certification process through the ICGLR into a process that has the confidence and, and of consumers and companies and NGOs um, that has working groups uh, that sets up and, and can, can work on the ground, get action on gold, um, and uh, lead the ICGR, ICGLR into a viable process. And this can occur at a minimal cost, but we need leadership to make this happen, as Tim also mentioned. Uh, just briefly as I wind up, uh, secondly, a monitoring team is, is really needed out in the region. As Undersecretary Hormatz pointed out, the link between the mines and the smelters uh, are sti is still very much in question, and, and it's a very murky trade. And so when I say monitoring team, what do we mean? Well, we need a, a, a team of 20 to 30 people to actually go out on the ground with international experts and regional groups uh, to monitor the mines and, and act as a kind of a whistleblower to say, all right, well, these mines are dirty. These mines are clean. These trading routes are dirty. If we pass such a supply chain uh, checkpoint, as we talked about, that would be flagged. Uh, and then finally, uh, to establish uh, penalties uh, for uh, any violators of that system. The current system is sort of in a self-policing function uh, de facto at the moment. The ICGLR, which was brought up earlier, has a penalties function but is not yet uh, operational. And so uh, it would be very helpful if the U.S. Uh, can lead uh, a process to help establish this monitoring team with a policing function that can actually work. Just as I, I wind up, uh, uh, I would like to quote a miner that I, that I spoke to uh, on this last trip. He said, a system to monitor the trade is the best thing that could happen to us. It would allow us to make the most out of our business. And so we want to support uh, those miners uh, out in the region, and, and we'll continue to do so through our movement uh, that's rapidly growing on this issue. We're working with 45 university campuses and city councils uh, across America. And we'll be launching a larger campaign uh, on this issue in the fall. So thanks so much, and uh, looking forward to questions and comments. Thanks very much, uh, Sasha, and all the panelists. Um, our, our hosts here have uh, graciously granted us uh, another 15 minutes, if people are willing to stay around. Uh, <laughs> to uh, ask some questions of the panelists. So uh, we have a couple of microphones out there. Um, yeah, here in the middle. Hi, my name is uh, Friedemann. I'm, I've been working for three years with the ICGLR that has been already mentioned as an advisor from the German government. And uh, I would just like to underline one point or one a aspect of this problem that hasn't been mentioned so far. That's the regional dimension of this problem. Um, this this trade in minerals throughout the region has been has been one of the most contentious issues between nations um, in the in the Great Lakes region, and some of those nations didn't even have diplomatic relations in the meantime. So now they have been reestablished, and the situation is is much better. And this the summit that was also mentioned was a major step for this regional dialogue about these problems and, and um, finding solutions together. So what I would like to underline is that in the future, even if we are talking about um, putting the certification system together, it is important to see this, this regional aspect and um, that the countries in the region need to continue working together on all levels, from the highest political level to the technical level. Um, what I want to ask, uh, particular Your Excellency, uh, Ambassador, um, and Sasha, it was mentioned that in the meantime, until we have a, a viable certification mechanism, there will be people who, who suffer from this development and who are already suffering. The tin price dropped from 10 to $3, I heard last week, in Eastern DRC, and many people are out of work. How, how do we manage that, that time? Uh, from now until we have something that is in place. Um, the Congolese government has already experiences from this presidential decree banning um, all mineral exports. What, 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 what were the experiences 
is there anything going on th thinking about what can be done and, and, and what, is, what, what are you thinking? <coughs> Go ahead. Uh, thank you for your question. Yes, indeed, the, the government had banned exploitation of minerals in that area, but that has been lifted uh, mainly because of what you've just mentioned. Um, we are all driven to put a stop in the illegal mining in that region, but we are also aware that 70% of the economy in that region depends on the mining. Uh, we know that there are hundreds of thousands of people whose livelihood depends on this mining issue. So the current embargo is hurting very, very, very hard. Uh, this good idea, the Doug Frank bill, which is a very good idea, we need to really come up with uh, a transitional solution so that we can avoid a good idea to become harmful. Uh, because we've noticed also that when I talk even about uh, sporadic attacks in that region, it's because some of these people whose livelihood depended on it, they have converted, some of them at least, have converted their activity into banditry. So we need to come up very quickly with a transitional solution rather than maintaining this embargo until a certification system comes in place. And this is what actually uh, the <coughs> purpose of uh, the delegation of the Ministry of Mines, uh, that's why they are here in Washington, to meet with people and to discuss and work together with the industries, by the way, uh, to discuss and see how we can put in place uh, some kind of median uh, solution until we get to a final solution. Sasha or anyone else? want to answer as well yeah sure thank you very much for your uh, question freedom and I, I fully agree with uh, what you mentioned about the regional that I mentioned very important uh, that we continue to to work at that level uh, as the minerals get smuggled out I think that uh, what you're highlighting is is very very important uh, to deal with uh, I think that we we recognize that uh, this process is very complicated and it's not going to be s resolved. We're dealing with a war with beneficial beneficiary actors who have profited from that war. And if we don't take strong actions, then those particular strong actors, we're talking about the commanders and the, the businesses that have, pro that have helped those commanders profit, uh, will not be dislodged from their uh, positions and will continue to perpetuate that war. I think we're seeing some progress uh, towards that as commanders have uh, pulled out of some mines and uh, actually several have come to us complaining uh, that uh, their profits are being hurt. Uh, at the same time, you're right, there are thousands of innocent miners who are being hurt in that process. I think that, uh, first of all, I would support what uh, Tim mentioned in terms of uh, developing projects for assisting those uh, communities. Uh, I think uh, it would be important for companies to, to contribute that and, and make that part of the public-private partnership. Uh, secondly, I think we need to, to have some sort of a short transitional process and uh, uh, as the full regulations of the bill uh, get uh, worked on and implemented and we're working with uh, industry and the OECD to come up with some, some recommendations along those lines. Uh, and then thirdly, I think that uh, you know, part of the problem with the, the current situation is that the industry had, had been developing their system and the region had been developing their system. What we need is a process to bring those two together, and so we agree on the right standards. And so, you know, developing these uh, supply chain pilots uh, that, you know, will have pilot mine sites where industry can buy directly from there uh, would actually help get those clean mines restarted, provided that they have uh, monitoring and verification. All right, thank you. Next. Yes, uh, this gentleman here in the in the middle. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sasha and uh, John. This is Imeta Mwangachuchem from DRC. I have uh, Wiwone Mines, which uh, I have invited uh, enough to visit. But really, we, have, uh, we are facing a big problem here because we welcome the system to be put in place. But it seems that those who are in charge 
for example, in the north, in the south, Kivu, they claim that they don't have enough money to do that, to certify some mine. And now what we are facing is that those companies that were legitimate, who were coming to buy minerals, have a shut away. Now we have a people who just come, for example, the three months ago, one pound of uh, tantalumo was the 14 dollars. Now it's 1.2. So really, you have legitimate companies that very soon are going out of the business. So what can you do to certify those mines that are recognized by you, our government so that they can do legitimate uh, business? Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll uh, uh, take the first uh, crack. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mwagachuchu. Uh, uh, it was um, very interesting visiting your, your mine in, in Congo. It's one of those who, who also uh, visited there. I think that the key really is to develop uh, the due diligence and verification uh, uh, processes. And so we have an agreed upon due diligence process with the OECD. Um, and we've been working with the, the companies on this end to urge them to implement uh, those OECD due diligence guidelines. I think it's critical that the companies on the ground do similar. And, and I think that one of the key parts of that due diligence process is having these on the ground audits. And I think that if those audits are credible and have independent verification uh, accompanied with the rest of the due diligence steps, then companies will have the confidence to uh, to purchase. We're not trying to drive try to trade away from the region, I, but I think that, you know, um, making sure uh, that those steps are taken are, are the, is the critical link uh, to linking them back with international markets. I think that what's happening now is, is, uh, is troubling but, but temporary and can be solved with some of those steps. Thank you. Um, in the back over here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Karina Gilfill, and I'm with uh, Global Witness. Um, I just wanted to. Uh, I had a question for um, for for Tim, and then for the uh, ambassador. Um, I just wanted uh, to follow up on on what Sasha just said about the OECD diligence guidance. Um, and I know your company and others have done some good work uh, on some of the voluntary initiatives you were describing. But I just wondered, since the OECD due diligence guidance has been adopted since last year, um, what steps uh, your company and others are taking to implement the due diligence? Under Secretary Hormat's uh, said the State Department would be coming out with a public statement urging companies to do that. I realize that it can't just be the end users, however, it has to be across the supply chain. And we've seen uh, through our research, I think the UN group of experts and others have recently highlighted that there are some encouraging shifts on the ground of some mines that have been demilitarized. BCA, mine, the largest tin ore, is a mine where, there, where that has recently happened. And so I wondered if there's uh, opportunities for the end users to work with smelters uh, with the support of the Congolese government, the UN, and the U.S. to, to set up um, and implement the due diligence uh, standards and to begin to establish a clean trade in the Eastern Congo, Cong uh, Congo right now uh, as we speak. Um, and then I just wanted to follow up with uh, Her, Excell Her Excellency the Ambassador about what the Congolese government can do as far as uh, building on some of the good reforms that you had talked about in working to ensure that some of those mining areas that have been demilitarized do stay that way, and we can support working with industry and the U.S. government in trying to come up with a, um, you know, with a clean trade um, right now as we speak now. So we begin to create a legitimate trade that provides good livelihoods for people in the region. Thank you. So, great question. Um, so in terms of the OECD guidelines, uh, we're totally in support of what those guidelines say. Um, and how can we as end user companies try to support those guidelines going into implementation and practice. Um, one of the things I said is we have the conflict-free smelter program, which is kind of that choke point in the middle. Um, I also mentioned that right now it's very difficult to certify any materials coming out of the Congo uh, into a smelter and make that smelter conflict-free. Uh, the one exception to that is materials that have actually gone through the OECD due diligence process. And so as end users, the ones who create the demand, or at least part of the demand on the other side, we have said that if the minerals coming into the smelter are from the region, 
but have met all the due diligence requirements of set out by the OECD guidelines, they will be accepted. So that's one way that we've moved forward. It's necessary but not sufficient in that, uh, as the previous questioner came up with, we, we have a situation on the ground that is not really allowing a lot of this due diligence to go on. Uh, so we've also engaged in the public-private partnership with the State Department, uh, uh, multinationals, and the U.S. Um, government agencies to try to really build that on-the-ground, uh, reliable, sustainable certification system. Uh, to answer your question about what the Congolese government is doing in order to maintain the demilitarized area, uh, demilitarized, um, uh, the, uh, the government has been training mining police, and they have been deployed uh, progressively in some of the areas that are militarized. Also, we have, we are progressively opening administration's offices with experts in mining in those areas as we go. And uh, you did re mention that the State Department will be putting out guidance uh, shortly that uh, we would expect will we'll encourage that same kind of process, the, the beginning of the process of compliance with the OEC, uh, OECD uh, guidelines. Um, yes, right over here. Maybe, I think this, well, maybe one more after this. This will be the second to last. Yes, thank you, uh, Veronica Kohler from the National Mining Association here in the United States. I, uh, I applaud the Dodd-Frank and the goals that it identifies. And I also appreciate the panel being able to identify that um, perhaps to achieve these goals, we would have to look at more of the informal sector and not so much the formal sector in how it's um, contributing negatively to the human rights violations and armed conflict. And so my question is to the panel, how do we make sure that um, Dodd-Frank, whereas it's raising visibility on the issue, which is a good thing, it moves forward and moves closer to the ground to ensure that the informal sector is, we, one can facilitate it to be formalized rather than having that adverse impact on the artisanal mining community and what some people say 80% of product that leaves DRC coming from that informal sector. So even if we have certification schemes that are put in place and monitoring systems currently that would be put in place, the reality is on the ground in some of these artisanal and small-scale mining communities, they, the um, international community would be appalled at the manner in which they are operating. And so how do we provide opportunities and support and projects that are done cohesively and, and inclusively that would improve operations on the ground and allow these communities to um, perform their income generating opportunities in a manner that would be internationally acceptable, focusing on those human rights violations as well. I think, I think, uh, I think part of uh, the solution uh, to that is, is getting some pilot areas going uh, that have credibility uh, attached to them. It's, it's very difficult to have international investors. I, I certainly, if I was an investor, wouldn't want to invest in a mine where the FDLR is, you know, one mile away and the Congolese army uh, is, is sitting there. But in the reality, that, that particular army unit was a rebel group three years ago um, and has a parallel uh, command structure, etc. I think that, you know, as we try to establish some traceability uh, and, and monitorability verification uh, steps uh, that w we can actually have some pilot mine sites and then drive investors toward that region. I think we're starting to see the outlines of this already. We, there's one Canadian gold mining company that's out there uh, working and will probably start exporting uh, relatively soon. The Malaysian Smelting Corporation uh, just signed an agreement to take over uh, uh, joint ventures with uh, uh, on, on several mines in that area. So you're starting to see the outlines of this, uh, but particularly on gold, we're going to need uh, a lot more of that, although that has to be done in a very transparent way. Uh, international mining companies have uh, a bad history in that region, unfortunately, with Anglo Gold Ashanti's 
uh, uh, support to a uh, rebel group in just uh, an area just north of there a few years ago. Um, so that needs to be done with transparency and, and making sure that there's this verification process. But I think that, you know, as we continue to, to, to drive and, and build the standards that people can agree on through certification, that that, that can actually occur. I think we're, uh, our overtime period has, oh, extra time has expired. Um, thanks to all of you for coming. I encourage you to pick up the paper outside. Thanks to Steve McDonald and Mike Van Dusen and Jane Harmon for hosting us. Thank you for an excellent panel. And uh, Tim said uh, in his address that uh, we've really got to do this because uh, the consequences are too dire. Uh, we will be looking at some of the consequences on June the 30th next week when we have Dr. McQuigge from the Ponzi Hospital here uh, talking about some of the impact of gender-based violence there. So come and join us for that. <laughs>